Well, hello and welcome to PM Personality Profile. My name is Nanan Sakwa the fourth. And as usual, you know, come the end of the week, we always bump into a little champion. Sometimes they're big, sometimes they're small in personality, but the achievements are huge. They may not be from Ghana, but their story is worth telling. These are some of the things that, you know, the young ones watch, listen, and uh, get inspired. That, well, if she did it, if he did it, maybe I can also do it. And they may not necessarily be from Ghana. And exactly today, we're speaking to Susan Ngongi Namondo, not from Ghana, obviously by the name, from Cameroon, representative of the UNICEF. And she's been here a while, but she has a story. She didn't just suddenly pop up here. So we've, you know, stepped into her office to find out the days in Cameroon and how it is that she ended up in UNICEF, ended up in Ghana, and now leaving. And as usual, every Friday I tell you, bring the kids around the telly so they can listen, particularly if you have daughters. Here's a lovely woman achiever who has a story to tell. Don't move, we're coming straight back. Well, welcome to the favorite part. Thank you very much for staying, but let me say that, Susan, I am so much in love with your name, Ngongi Namondo. I think it's just rich. I mean, nobody would ever doubt you are. African and where you come from and I mean how do you grow up with such a name? <laughs> well if you come from where I come from, which is um Boya, I'm a Bakwarian, mm -hmm. those are the names you get. Gongi yeah. Namondo. At least lucky. I think one in twenty Bakwari women are called Namondo. So it's one of our names. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You guys are lucky. <laughs> <I> <laughs> no, mean, come, come, come. We can give you a name as well. I, I wouldn't mind. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, as a chief, I wouldn't Nana in Gongi Manomodo. I mean, you wouldn't know whether to stand up by Namanga, Ikomi, SME. We have lots of names. That's nice. <laughs> It's a nice name. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for uh, inviting us to your office. But I want to go all the way back to 7th of August. Which, which year was this? I mean, am I allowed to? <laughs> There's no shame. 1971. Look at that. Mm. Same year as me. Really? Yeah. Okay. It was a special year. It was you a see? good year. <laughs> I see. I see. So this, this was in Cameroon. This was in Cameroon. Cameroon. Yes. What was growing up like in Cameroon? Uh, I, generally, I'm one of those truly privileged people, okay. I think. I think um, I'm lucky to come from parents who generally are sensible people, who generally wanted their children, who wanted us to do well, who had the understanding and resources to invest in their children. So I had a great childhood. I went to school. Um, I was taken care of. I was loved. I did not suffer from any major deprivations. I was not working to, to take care of mm -hmm. myself as a child. Working was, for You house. know, I, I, I didn't have to do that cell before you go to school, you know, that yeah. sort of thing. I did not have to do that. I did not face um, great abuse at home. You know, people were not just beating me left, right and center mm -hmm. because they were stressed with their lives. I ate well when I was sick. I went to hospital. So it was a good life. It was a very good life. Uh, it's nice to hear a good story like this. I don't know in Cameroon, or, but I, th I think somewhere, I, I don't know if it's an African issue, but in Ghana sometimes you get a sense that you sometimes feel apologetic that, you know, my father did well for us. And, oh, they had a silver spoon in their mouth. As if it's a crime to do well, to look after you, to, after your people. I don't know if you get the same... I think the obligation we have, the problem is that so many people are not doing well. And the obligation we have, especially working for UNICEF, is that we all have to, in our own small way, try to make sure that others also mm -hmm. do well, that we, we increase the size of that pie. All children should have a wonderful childhood. Mm -hmm. All children should be able to go to school. All children should be loved. All children should not be abused. I'm not suggesting that my parents were perfect. They were not no. perfect beings. But they were mature people, relatively mature. My mother was a bit young when she had me, but they were relatively mature people, rel good sense, you know, who then are willing to invest and take care of their children. I'm sure if you have children today, you have children. Yeah, I, I do. Yeah. Yes, I do. I'm sure With you... With one on the way. 
with one, oh, congratulations. Yeah. Oh, very good. Mm. Um, I have a 10 month old daughter. So yes, ah. I have yeah. And my one will probably pop around, around your birthday. Really? Yeah, okay. that's a little close there. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. But no, we, we, we are lucky enough to have had certain investments made in us. And congratulations on your baby. Thank you yeah. very much. <laughs> We've had investments made in us, so then now we also know better how to take care of our children, mm. right? We can give them better chances, but also that somehow in our role in society, if we can work so that all children have that good fortune. Well, so what, what did your father do then? Uh, my father was um, an agronomist. Okay. So he started out, he worked in civil service um, in Cameroon, Ministry of Agriculture. He actually came to Ghana. So we had a two year stint in Ghana where one of my brothers was born Look in Kumasi. It was that. an agricultural research station. So he came here. Um, and then from there, he just climbed his way up and eventually ended up in the UN system. Okay. My father worked with World Food Program. I see. And your mom? My mom started off, I think she taught a little bit, but then she decided to stay back and she raised us. Okay, how many siblings? Uh, four. Eldest? Yes. You sound like the eldest. <laughs> <laughs> you, just, you just sound like the eldest. <laughs> and uh, so you did your primary school? In... I did my primary school. And then um, at some point um, in the teenage years, we started moving as so. a family. So the WFP, well, actually, first they worked, my father worked for the embassy in Rome. So that took us to Rome, and then from there he worked with... Be before we get to Rome, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we, we in Ghana, I mean, like, I would say that, you know, when I was going to primary school, in my days, Martin de Porris, and even though I must say that I think it's better now than when I was there, which yeah. is very weird, but normally we would say that, oh, you know, in the olden days, the primary schools were much better than mm. it is today. In, mm. in Cameroon, do you have the same story or generally it's, it's better now than it was then? Mixed picture. I think mm. it's very similar to what's in Ghana. I think mm. part of the challenge where we say the old days were better, mm. we have succeeded in making sure that um, most primary age school children are actually in school. For instance, now in Ghana, if I'm not mistaken, I think 91% mm -hmm. of all primary school age children are in school. Whereas only 10 years ago, it was 56%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've yeah. increased, the so children are in school. But what we have not done as well is to make sure that we increase the resources also allocated to schools and the education system to ensure that the quality did not slip back. Yeah. And everywhere, well, maybe not everywhere, but many places on the continent, including Ghana, including Cameroon, I think we have not done a fantastic job of making sure that the management is right. So resources might be going in, maybe they're not enough, but we're not making sure that the resources that are going into education are managed as effectively as they could. So uh, it's, it's, uh, numbers could be one of the issues. Numbers could be one of the issues. I mean, if you're going to have, if your resources were catering mm. for 56% and now you have 91%, many mm. more kids in there, um, you need to make sure that you have more resources. You need more books, more schools, more teachers, more everything, everything. Yeah? more chalk, more everything. Mm. Uh, but having said that also, I think the management bit for me is also very important because mm. resources are going, yeah. but we're not making sure that each PESWA or each franc CFA is working as hard as it could work. could work. Yeah. It's a real challenge because yeah. we all know that, I mean, to progress in the future, to reach our development aspirations, you need education. You need quality education. Undoubtedly. Yes. But sec secondary education in Cameroon or by this time you were hopping around? Um, uh, by this time I started hopping around. So I began in Cameroon, did some in, in Rome. The okay. parents were afraid of ending up with children they did not recognize. So shipped back to Cameroon where I did higher school. <laughs> um, before then I was ready for university and started hopping to other places. Hopping well. around. Mm -hmm. Was your ambition to end up in the UN? You know, when you... No, not really. I mean, as a child, I was fairly confused, like I think many children mm -hmm. are, um, except the privileged few. Mm -hmm. I, at some point, I wanted to be a seamstress because my grandmother was a seamstress mm -hmm. and she was just one of the chicest people I know. <laughs> um, um, but, oh, and I wanted to be a farmer. 
In okay. fact, when I went to school, my educational path was so that I could go back and do um, farming animals. Okay. But oh, someone, why is that? Was that daddy was doing something like that. My grandfather was um, was an agriculture man, so okay. he was always, you know, he's always had a farm and always known about that. That's that's very much my life um, in Cameroon. <laughs> And my father is an agronomist, so mm -hmm. while he was not working on a farm, he's, we constantly talk about that. So, and when I was going to school, which I, we shouldn't do these days, but when I was going to university, very much had the conversation with my parents of, you will study something that's likely to get you a job. So please, 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 literature is fantastic. Study it as a minor. That should not be what you leave school with. Dance is wonderful, but that should not be what you leave school with. Um, um, which, of course, it's not very PC these days. You know, we should be studying all of these things are very important. The culture, is, the, culture is, the arts are very yeah. important. But there was additional pressure to study something that I could get employed in, in Cameroon um, when I came out. So agriculture was it, but somewhere along. But, so, but did you do some agriculture in school? Or? Oh yes, yeah. so I have a, both a bachelor's and a master's degree in animal science and animal health, <laughs> respectfully. <laughs> I had other degrees along the way also, but uh, those I have, yeah. I see. Mm -hmm. And did you go back to Cameroon? I did. Think? So after university, I, um, I went back to Cameroon, searched, searched, and, and you know how looking for a job nowadays is difficult. It's very difficult. It's one of the big problems of the mm -hmm. continent. I, like many others, could not find work. Um, paid employment easily did not come. And the idea was, okay, maybe to, to start the farm, literally. <laughs> There's no shortage of land yeah. where I come <laughs> from. And at the time, I. If you're going to do an animal farm, you need to be in a place that's a little bit isolated mm -hmm. because of the diseases. Mm -hmm. Where we, I come from is very humid, um, so it's really a hotbed for diseases. Okay. We have a lot of them. So to be in a relatively isolated area, mm -hmm. to limit the exposure to people who basically, a lot of them bring these diseases um, yeah. um, and walk around with them. And so I went, so I was in Cameroon, turned around, turned around, the job was not coming. So we discussed this with the family, maybe I could start something. Mm. I was 22 when I graduated from university. So 22 in an isolated area, you know. Trying to start a farm. <laughs> trying to start a farm. Because by that time, grandpa was no longer, you know, trying to fight. So I did what many people do, wangled my way into a master's degree <laughs> and, and did continued animal health. Did that, came back, and yeah, I just was not ready for the relative isolation. See, I mean, even now, you know, you come across a really bubbly person. So I can imagine at 22, you must have been the wild chick. Now, you know, I'm just trying to imagine, you know, a bunch of- I was a 22 year old. 22, I'm just, I'm just trying to look at you and a bunch of cows or a fleet of sheep. Say, so, yep, that's- Yeah, cows, that's... cows was actually it. But that business idea that I had, which basically is to buy from the northern part of the country, they walk the cows down, basically. Okay. Now, our railroad is not performing. They walk, most of them walk the cows down and then sell it. So the idea is buy it, fatten them up, then sell it. That is it, something that we're thinking of because eventually in all these years, a family farm was, um, was established. Mr. Ngongi retired. He went and created a farm. So that idea that was had then, that was born then, is going to be implemented, I hope, by next year. So we start small. So when I retire, I have an activity to do. <laughs> you, haven't given, you haven't given up? No, no. My money is still going to the farm, though. I mean, you know, <laughs> still support it, even though I'm not there. So uh, mainly it's animal husbandry now, mainly, or do you do crop as well? Oh, we do crop as well. It started up um, as an oil palm. Okay. Yeah, so oil palms was the idea. I don't think it's doing as well as we hoped they would do, but oil palms was it. And then part of it now has been converted, so food crops. Um, that are being sold. Um, it's a wonderful experience, actually. And um, poultry. Okay. And um, pigs. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we've had such bad luck with the pigs, um, African swine fever, many mm -hmm. diseases. Oh, yeah. It's been it's been it's been very difficult. But yeah, so it's there. So my father likes to say that he's a um, he has the most expensive hobby, his farm. <laughs> <laughs> but who knows? When I retire, maybe finally I will get through to my. So the moment that he's on his farm, he's know, on his farm, he's loving on, it. I, I suppose he's on his farm, loving it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's nice and it sends a good image. Like I said before the show, that you know, get you know the young ones around there. You know, as are now educated. Nice looking pretty woman hoping to get on the farm. So it's not for the illiterate. Mass. No, no. And I, we have done a huge disservice. We have done a huge disservice because even where I come from, many people don't want to do work the land, so to mm -hmm. speak, because it's seen as really for the others. Yeah. We all aspire, for better or for worse, to a job, you know, in an office with a computer and you know. And and unfortunately this continent is not able to provide that yet for everybody. It is not. And I think um, our governments um, along the line, we, 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 we did agriculture wrong. We, should have, we should, really should have invested more in agriculture. Mm -hmm. I think the government here in Ghana has been talking a lot about agriculture. Mm -hmm. Many governments are talking a lot about agriculture. But um, we lost the plot a few decades ago, really. Yeah. And I hope we get it back on. Because there's absolutely nothing wrong absolutely nothing wrong in being able to grow food and not just grow food, then finding ways to transform it and adding value to it, etc. Now, you know, when we were in school, we all had beds and Mr. Mwakwata, God bless his soul, always let us plant radish. <laughs> why, why radish and nothing else? But at least, you know, there was one day a week that we looked forward to going on this little bed and see the plants grow and mm. harvesting time. He took it all anyway, you know, harvesting time. You know, by the time we get old, haven't we have missed it? If we sit by a desk, by a desk, by a desk, and you get through university, and I'll say, okay, now that's it. Go back and dig your bed and start planting no, radish. You wouldn't be able to. We should start a bit earlier. Of course, you should start earlier. Uh, I think, for instance, everywhere I have been, I've always had a home garden. Okay, nothing elaborate. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that I have acres and mm -hmm. No, nothing elaborate. But for instance, here in Ghana, I uh, grow my own bitter leaf. Okay. I like bitter leaf. I have a few plants there that I grow. Um, it's mostly ornamental because... Uh, but I think there's a lot of value in growing things. There's a lot of value to be able to tend it. You, you plant a little something, you watch it grow, you harvest it, you actually eat it. I think there's some value there. But we are lucky where in our case we can romanticize it a little bit because we don't have to depend on that to really feed ourselves. Mm -hmm. We have another um, activity that allows us to be able to feed ourselves. But for many people, they depend on that to mm -hmm. be able to live. And generally, um, um, <laughs> I didn't know I had this much passion for agriculture, but generally, <laughs> <laughs> generally, I think our governments could have done more mm. to valorize agriculture in our society. Where I come from, in Boya, it is, it is not acceptable that most young people don't feel as if agriculture is a viable um, uh, means of employment. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, most of our working population is working and agriculture, okay. right? If we really want to touch the lives of many people and improve it, improve agriculture. Okay. Find a way for them to make more money in agriculture. Mm. They will use that money and take better care of their children and improve their lives, etc. Let, let me stay with agriculture a little bit before I move away, even though. But have you, have you noticed that people who made a living out of agriculture would educate their children away from the farms? Yes, but that, is a mind thing. I think that's more of a mindset thing. As you said earlier, oh, it's for the literates. Mm. We, we have all been thinking, in, we, we all aspire to be more modern and better, mm -hmm. etc. right? And the model that somehow we seem to have bought is, okay, you send them off to school, they learn well, or they get degrees, and they go off and work in an office. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just that our economies are not structured yet to be able to absorb that. So whereas that might be a narrative that works perfectly well for Japan mm -hmm. or perfectly well for the United States or in wherever, it, it doesn't work yet for us. 
And therefore, our model should be something a little bit different. By all means, send them to school, send them to learn something, let them get degrees. But if in our current situation, we don't have all those office jobs, mm -hmm. in our current situation, um, um, we have a lot of people working on the farms, well, we should be finding a way to make sure that they go off to school to learn things that are relevant for them to come and use on that farm so, later. And probably feed all those in Japan and America who are in offices, <laughs> you know, to make our money. I'm going to take a break here, and then uh, when I come back, we just want to find out how it is that Susan ended up in the UN and the UNICEF. Don't go. Well, thank you very much for staying. I told you it's going to get interesting, but I want to find out how this, you know, lovely 22-year-old lady <laughs> hopping, waiting for some cows to fatten up, life didn't work out, goes, gets his master's degree still. It's a challenge, you know, trying to till the land. Oh, dealing animal husbandry ends up in UNICEF. Mm. Was so there any intermediary before UNICEF or you hopped straight into no, UNICEF? No, 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 it was a little bit of an intermediary mm -hmm. before UNICEF. So, so, what was my story? So, couldn't get the job, floated around a little bit, I managed to get an internship with um, Catholic Relief Services okay. in the Gambia. So, it was an internship. So, did that for a little bit and came back home eating the parents' food, still no job. <laughs> Uh, then ended up on another internship um, with Caritas in Senegal. Okay. So same region. So then finished that, came back, mm, <laughs> doing little odd jobs. Then managed to, then because I was, I was roaming around Rome at that time, mm. managed to get a little bit of work with in the International Plant Genetic Resources Institute, IBGRI some assistant, research assistant. I made photocopies, I think, and, <laughs> and ran errands for people. And then from there, I ended up in IFAD, um, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, okay. um, as a consultant, a junior consultant. Um, in the meantime, I was just sending out thousands of applications out into the world, hoping something would come through. And eventually, um, something came through with UNICEF in Southern Sudan. That's far from home. 2000, yeah, 2000. Mm. It's far from home, but at that point, you know, you need a job. <laughs> at some point, you need a job. <laughs> so, so it looked adventurous. I had absolutely nothing to lose, and I went. Packed your bags? Packed my little bags <laughs> and went off. It was an amazing experience, actually. I think mm. I'm very lucky to have started my humanitarian um, UN career in southern Sudan, because it was, it was, there was a conflict, a north-south mm -hmm. conflict at that time. There was an active war going on. And you could see how the system is able or not able to adequately respond to some of these, um, some of these um, situations. It was, it was a very good experience. Because I think there was a, there was a hunger warning then that mm -hmm. look, the, 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 there was no major intervention. There was going to be this. Yeah, no, there were several. There was several. They had a famine um, in ninety something, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. They had a famine, a bona fide famine. Um, I joined in two thousand, so two thousand is when I went, and the situation was truly dire. Um, was as it a shocking young for you? It was very shocking. As a young person, you know, like oh, I'm African. I understand the realities of Africa, <laughs> the arrogance of young people. <laughs> um, I knew Cameroon. I was very familiar with my region of Cameroon. I'm very familiar with some of the more rural areas um, around where I come from. I thought I, you know, I thought I understood what poverty was. I went into southern Sudan at the time. Um, the first location I ever visited was called Woodier in eastern Upper Nile. And I kid you not, I did not see social infrastructure that I recognized as a young person. Wow. There was no school, there was no church, there was no structure that you recognize as social infrastructure. But there were people there? There were people and cows. Plenty wow. of cows. Wow. Sudanese love their cows. The <laughs> Dinkas, I should say, in a particular group, really amazing cows. So I looked at this situation and I thought, but this is not how it's supposed to be, you know? This is not how it's supposed to be. Um, this is how maybe people lived. Uh, right after Adam. A long time ago, you know? This is not how it's supposed to be now. And I remember being shocked, um, absolutely shocked. 
And um, yeah, I spent, I spent quite a few years in that environment. Huge learning, huge, huge Did it learning. prepare you for some of the challenges I had? Oh, amazing. I mean, I did things in Sudan that, you know, I've been caught in crossfire where I've, I've had to lead a team, uh, you know, to get away from um, fighting. In this particular location, I was in Western Upper Nile in Niall. And um, there was Peter Gadet and Peter Paul, two warlords who were fighting against each other. We you know we had shown up, we had not known. Normally we check, UN security is quite rigorous about these things. We show up, we didn't know. We hear shooting, we get on airboats, we, I mean, walking back to safety, security people had managed to, to negotiate sort of safe passage for us. Um, I've dealt with people did, who did we call... Did not say, look, Susan, get back home now? <laughs> <laughs> I am grateful that there was no interference. Um, uh, uh, because, no, you learn. And, and these sorts of things, quite frankly, I think you can do at that age. There's also a certain uh, not fully realizing what dangers you mm. might be facing that happens in, in some of those um, in some of those environments. Today as a mother with a ten month old, I would hesitate to put myself in Southern Sudan. But back then in my twenties, it was it adventure. was it was a great adventure. I've driven around with a dead body in my car once just because um, 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 this was in Rumbeck. And what's the story? I think I went to the airstrip um, there was some passenger who were on a plane, the guy was very sick, so the plane that was going back to base in Lokichoki had decided, okay, let's leave this man here, you know, and so then, because I happen to be there, you don't just leave somebody there who looks like, you know, that, I mean, incredible stories. Walked for miles to get to places, to talk to people, um, worked with people who, um, might, you know, in the midst of a war, people do, people do bad things <laughs> sometimes. I mean, just an incredible experience. And watching the UN infrastructure and how it deals in these situations, how it, it supports the people of Southern Sudan, that was a very good learning experience. I was going to ask you what your highlights have been, <laughs> you know, but probably this, that, that thing will be today's, will it? No, hi uh, highlights. I mean, every place is very different. Every place is very different. I mean, after the Sudan experience was sort of the beginning, and mm. it was, it was. I think I gave it a thousand percent. Um, 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 after that, I actually resigned from UNICEF. Really? Actually resigned. I, I think burnout. No, burnout. After a while, you know, you're just like, yeah. So I resigned. I went back to school. I thought maybe the animal health was not taking me where I needed to go. I now found myself in UNICEF. And I knew that I wanted to be with the UN at that point because mm -hmm. I'd worked with some NGOs before. And being there on the ground, you, 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 you look at the two. Um, we need NGOs in this business. We need the UN in this business. But at that point, I just decided, okay, I think I, think I want to try and be with the UN for, for some time. So, when I went back to school, uh, the animal health was not going to be, uh, you know, um, it's not a great degree for UNICEF. Let's put it that way. So I went and studied <laughs> public administration instead. <clears throat> that was in the UK? No, this one it was in the US, Columbia was, University. Columbia University, mm -hmm. oh, okay. And then you came back into the UN with that? And then I came back into the UN with that. So after I finished two years, and I was paying for it myself this time round, um, um, the places where I had connections were in Sudan, so I wrote to absolutely everybody looking for a job, and the job that I found was in um, Sudan. So I, I went back to Sudan. Went back home. I went back home, <laughs> Malacca. And then from there, yeah. Probably an, un, probably an unfair question, but <clears throat> we are in Ghana, and here am I going to ask you, I mean, which of the African countries has been, wow, that is such an unfair question. That's very unfair. <laughs> very yeah. unfair be question. Careful, be careful but what I will tell you, you though is, is <laughs> what I will tell you though is, prior to Ghana, I was in Comoros, okay. and when um, it was time to move from Comoros to another place, Ghana was my number one choice. I wanted to come to Ghana. Why? Oh, but Ghana, well. Ghana has this myth for an African. Oh, Ghana, the land of the black stars. You want to be here. Things are working. 
um, um, there seemed to be progress, forward movement. This is where I wanted to be. Yes. Nice to hear me. There you yeah. go. <laughs> <laughs> As you can see, I'm grinning from cheek to cheek. What, what's been the highlight in Ghana? The highlight in Ghana? Yeah. <clears throat> well, two things. Um, the first thing, what brought me here, the work. I think mm. the work, um, Team UNICEF and myself, I hope we really have been value added to the government of Ghana. Mm. We have been able to do some great work, I think, in supporting government's work. Um, in all the areas in which we work. We work mm -hmm. in water and sanitation, yeah. we work in social protection, um, education, health and nutrition, child protection. In all of those areas, incredible things have happened. In water and sanitation, for instance, um, we still have an unacceptable, only 14%, 15% of the population having proper latrines. Yeah. It's truly unacceptable. But there is a lot of um, will on the side of government to change that. So mm -hmm. the work we've been doing to try and make, um, supported by a lot of our donor partners, sure. for instance, because that goes without saying, UNICEF doesn't make money. Mm -hmm. So everything we, we are able to help with, uh, the money comes from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But um, this whole business of making sure that we have more toilets, the whole business of um, where attitudes need to be changed, that those attitudes are changed because mm -hmm. Um, some people are still not making the direct linkage between open defecation and diseases. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and we need toilets to separate ourselves from, from the yeah. pool. Um, so water and sanitation, a lot has happened. Um, health and nutrition also. I think that's a sector, a very structured sector, a very well-run sector um, that's happening. But also discovering that with all the progress that had been made with under five um, mortality, almost half of the babies, 40% of the children that are now dying under five are actually dying in the first month. There is a whole group of children that were somehow missed in the progress that was being made. So again, um, working so with- the first month? The first <coughs> month, the first 28 days. Wow. So about, uh, well, it, it's fallen, so now it's 29%, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. It's fallen. But I still, that's, it's, it's, it's a large number. It's a large number. number, yes, under five um, neonatal mortality. Yeah. So that sort of work um, in child protection, great policies have been put in place, um, child and family welfare policy, trying to make sure that families can be better supported mm -hmm. to take care of their children. Okay. Because a lot of the problems we have later on in life is how well the children were taken care of. Earlier when I was saying that I wasn't abused, I imagine children who suffer some abuse. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, many times it's because my parents don't know better. So they're stressed. Yeah, no. <clears throat> Let's go to social life. Let's go to yeah. social life, it's too I mean, heavy. I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean Ghana's a social. It's a no, social place. Social place. Mm -hmm. How has been social? I think social life has been good. I think social life has been I have some friends, some really good friends. Mm -hmm. Um, as a personality, I'm a bit of an introvert. Oh, okay. So you will not, I'm not the one you will see at every party. Oh, okay. um, I choose the parties I go to, and I make sure that those parties are outside of the public eye. <laughs> 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 but Ghana, Ghana has been fantastic. I've met some wonderful people here. That's what I will miss when I leave. I mean, if, if you had come in the public eye, the media would have loved you. Really? Yeah. That's okay. You would have been a superstar. But that's not my job. I hope that I hope you will you will look at my job and say she did her job well. <laughs> <laughs> my, job, my, my job is not necessarily to be in the public eye. <laughs> and so you'll be going to Eritrea. Yes. You know, we'll talk about Eritrea, but uh, I know recently you had a cooking you had a cooking yes, show. Yes, they made me cook yesterday. <laughs> well, what did you cook? I cook ndole. Okay. Yes, ndole and plantains, which is my favorite food. What's ndole? Ndole is bitter leaves. Okay. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Bitter leaves. And true, 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 true ndole is bitter leaves um, cooked with groundnuts. Yeah. Um, with some shrimp, etc. But now, in, increasingly, we're using egusi. Okay. So the ndole is a bit, you know, it's like, it's related. It's the cousin, the very close cousin to the palava sauce. 
Okay. Except for important differences, we don't mix our proteins. So in Ghana and Liberia and other West African countries, you will have the crab, you have the fish, you have meat, you have all sorts of different creatures like a, like a mini zoo. In, in the same pot. No, we don't, we, don't, we don't put them together like that. So you, you choose. You, you respect yes, each other. You, respect, you separate them. <laughs> um, so, so classical dole is um, also with maybe some shrimp. So it's very nice. Like the Dwala people, I think, in Cameroon are the ones who prepare nice. the best dole. But so it truly, and, and, and gra basically, and yeah. Peanut. But the way I make it, I sort of make it the... the as know. in peanut paste? As in peanut paste, yeah. Hmm. Anyway, so, but I used egusi. So use yesterday egusi. I used egusi. Yes, okay. I used egusi and, you know... Palm oil? You can use palm oil. Yesterday I used um, none. I used vegetable, um, the other vegetable oil. For sure. Can't say. And uh, plantain. <laughs> and plantain, hmm. which is very, it's very simple meal, very healthy for you, and super tasty. I'm coming for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, are you the? Do you love cooking, or you're the one that look? I know I how to cook, but I don't want to be. Love. There. I love. Well, I used to. I should say, I used to love entertaining. So I yes. used to cook a lot until Liberia. I was in Liberia as a deputy representative. Mm -hmm. I used to have dinners and I would cook I, because I liked the taste of my own food. Okay. Um, but once I became a representative in Comoros, I think I, cooking, I, I cook, I don't cook. Okay. I cook less, put it that way. I still, you know, I'd make some brunch. Basically, you do the omelets and you buy the bread or something. But um, I don't really invest that much time in the kitchen. Corporate Wednesday is obviously recognizing you as a corporate woman, you know, giving you an award. It must feel good. It feels very good. Very grateful. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, we uh, recognize uh, your, your good work you've done. Oh. But 2000 to date, I mean, being with the UNICEF, humanitarian, but which, 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 I mean, it's a wide, uh, what's your... Passion is it children, is it the animals, the women, you know, what, what's your passion? As a UNICEF representative, we exist to support children. So children, 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 yeah. children, children. It's, um, that's why we exist. Hmm. Hmm? That's why we exist. You're never short of work then. <laughs> no, never short of work, <laughs> never short of work. There will always be more to do. Hmm. Um, but in some parts of the world, there still is a lot to do. I mean, I don't think any other country will beat Sudan. So let's rule Sudan out. But for, apart from Sudan till now, you know, which other experiences have you looked at and think, oh my God, what's this? I think all countries have their unique challenges that you don't anticipate beforehand, mm -hmm. you know. So Sudan, well, Sudan was Sudan. Mm -hmm. Um, I worked in Nairobi as well, and it was, but it was a regional function, so I flew into many different countries, helping them with emergency response. Um, Liberia was interesting, because after the war, you had now had a situation where half of the country, close to half of the country, was living in the capital city. How do you manage that as a government? Yeah, a lot of them were living in Monrovia, and not only were they there in Monrovia, a lot of them were young, a lot of them are children. How do you manage such a young population, all hanging out in the capital? That is, that is very, very huge challenge, with no jobs, and you would know with all the other challenges that go with that. It's a huge challenge. It wasn't obvious how you advise the government yeah, to deal with that situation. Then Comoros was also very interesting. It's a very small place, um, four islands. One is still French, so three islands. That is the Union of Comoros. About 600 and something thousand people, although nobody really knows because we haven't counted in some time, <laughs> spread across three islands. The biggest island called um, Ngazija, um, having about 400 and something thousand. Small, with that smallness, how do they grow yeah, in Ghana? And, and, and they are islands, so they are off the coast. Here, at least when you're looking at the market, we're looking at 27 million or 29 million, however many millions we are now. It's, it's a significant market, but you're attached to other countries. So, you know, you, you can see how. And also in this environment, people are borders, so people are coming back and forth. They're sharing ideas. But in the Comoros, it's not obvious how the economy develops. So that's its challenge. 
Ghana has been interesting. Ghana has been the most comfortable, the most, you know. But the black star is so shiny outside. It could be a little bit shinier inside. I mean, there's, there's so much, uh, so many blessings here that I think sometimes perhaps the country could be further than it is. Maybe now a comment for you to make, but do you think we are being complicit? Complacency is setting in? I don't know, but I think what always helps for change to happen, people have to want change. People have to push for change. No, we have too much. What do you mean? I mean, we are blessed with so much. I mean, there's a country where Christians and Muslims live side by side, mm -hmm. you know, uh, there's food yeah. and uh, you know, there's the sea. There's... <laughs> well, I, I, was, I was just saying that maybe, maybe we are blessed with abundance and therefore we don't see the agency for saving or for striving for more. Here we are with a 500 kilometer coast. We have about a thousand freshwater river bodies. We have gold diamonds. We have forests, even though we are depleting them by the ages, but it's still there. You know, like everywhere we turn, and you know, there's relative peace. Mm, you know, there's a lot of peace. Cr you know, Christians and Muslims live side by side, no even care whose religion is what. So you don't wake up in the morning and think, well, I need to strive for something or make anything. But it's just, we're, just too, we're, we're probably too comfortable and... I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but I feel that we all should aspire to live great lives. So with all of this goodness that is in Ghana, and it's true, that's a lot of goodness. Many countries cannot boast of many of those things that you say. But wouldn't it be great if we also made sure that all the children who are now going to school actually come out knowing something, mm. yeah? that the quality of education is very good? Wouldn't it be fantastic to know that these children come out and actually they have something to do? that they're not in this permanent adolescence that goes into the 40s because mm -hmm. you couldn't find a job. No, they have a job and they can move on to the next phases of their life where they have a family, they take care of their family. Wouldn't it be wonderful for all of us to have excellent health? True, life expectancy has increased, but with this sanitation situation, we keep getting diarrhea and all that. You know, we're depleting our, the productivity that could have been used mm -hmm. for good. So I think we should aspire to live as good a life as we can live with those resources that we do have. We keep saying there's this rhetoric that, oh, we are not, and that's probably an African rhetoric, that, mm. oh, we are not where we were supposed to be. I mean, give one statistics about, you know, 14, 15% having, you know, proper lavatory. I mean, some of these things in 2017, I mean, being UNICEF and being a black person in Gongi, Namondo. There you go. <laughs> turn up, you know, at New York, you know, meeting other countries. And these are some of the statistics you're going to read out. I mean, some might be, it might be hard to mention. Well, there are two things. I think, I think I definitely believe, like I felt when I was in Woodier so many years ago in Southern Sudan, when I saw this situation of a lot of deprivation, thinking, no, this is not how people were supposed to live. I certainly believe that we should all aspire to as good a life as we can have. I don't, for me, that does not necessarily mean that everybody should have five cars and that, you know, no, that's not necessarily a good life. I think a good life is one in which you are relatively healthy, you have purpose, you feel like, you know, you're contributing in this world, that sort of thing. But to have that, people need jobs, you know. The quality of education really needs to be better. Um, the quality of health needs to be better. We all need to be living well. Um, our mental well-being uh, well needs to be better. That, those sorts of things. And I think we can make it better for everybody. Susan, Ebola days. How, how was Ebola days, you know? Oh, that's interesting. Of the four years I spent in Ghana, I think mm -hmm. those six months, because it the, the, the really peaked the second half, second six months of 2014, mm -hmm. right, if I'm not mistaken. I think those six months were my most difficult six months here because it was so, so unpredictable. Mm -hmm. We really did not know. And it was scary. It was frightening. I remember when I first heard about it, sort of around February, March, Liberia, Guinea, you're like, okay, 
Okay, it seems maybe isolated there. And then you realize, but no, this thing is moving. It, it could come to yeah. us. Um, yes, those were really challenging days. Remember when UNMIR was set up, the UN mission, mm -hmm. um, um, as uh, a UNICEF representative. I was resident coordinator at the time, actually, so that was an additional challenge. I, I actually interviewed AI. the, 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 uh, the tall chap. The, there was a, there's a tall chap that came to uh, head UNMIR. Yes. Tony Banbury, if yes. I'm not mistaken. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. I had a word with him. Yeah. Very nice, very nice job. Mm -hmm. So no, it was challenging. And, and because it was so new, sim things like when Claire, exactly what sort of programming to do to be able to contain it, the policy frameworks were not in place. So for instance, if I got sick, for whatever reason I got infected, then what do we do? You know, it was so many things where, where it, was, it was a very challenging time, and I'm very grateful it never came here. And it's over now. We're going to take a break, and then when we come <laughs> back, uh, well, Susan is off to Eritrea, and guess what? The last time we had a quote-unquote a foreign guest on our show, he was from Eritrea. Eritrea. <laughs> We're coming back. <laughs> well, what a beautiful conversation, huh? What a beautiful conversation. But, you know, we're going to lose out to uh, Susan. She's heading over to uh, Gabriel Salasi's town, uh, Eritrea. But Gabriel was sad to leave here, so I'm sure Susan will be sad to leave. You must be sad to leave. I mean, even if you're not, you have to pretend. I'm <laughs> very sad to leave. <laughs> very sad to leave. Um, um, I've loved my life here. Mm. Um, I've been very, very... Ghana has been very good to me. Mm. But you know, in our work, yeah. one thing you're sure of is one day you'll pack up your little bags and go somewhere else. That, that you're sure. So you, you know that at the back of your head, at some point, all that goodness will come to an end. And you have to go somewhere else and seek goodness. Settle. Yeah. Just when you settle into the system, exactly. you need to pack up again. Exactly. I sp I'm sure you know Gabriel. Uh, Gabriel Salas. Gabriel Haile. Yes, Haile, yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, Haile was my last non ghanaian guest, mm -hmm. and he also was missing Ghana. Mm -hmm. And he, unlike you, did every party. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he did my share of yes, the parties, did, I did, think. Did, I'm sure he, he did the share of the party. And, uh, you know, Gabriel's kids were sad to leave Ghana. But luckily, you know, Olivia Nemene, she's mm -hmm. only. 10 months. She's only 10 months. So she's not going to wing you now. But how, how do you, are you able to balance? Because I mean, your work is demanding and 10 months is also demanding. I mean, how do you balance? It's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely not easy. But I'm managing. I'm coping. I'm still not getting my full night of sleep, but I'm coping. <laughs> and we're very lucky here in UNICEF that we have a crash. Ah, I was just going to say, we have are you crash. tempted to bring her to work? Yes. So we have a crash. So most days actually, she comes to the office. The poor one already has a work schedule. So she comes to the office from like 10 to 2 something. So then I have the ability of interacting with her a little bit, um, feeding her and that sort of thing. Ah, isn't that nice? Mm -hmm. isn't it that is. Nice? It isn't is. that nice? I mean, I think that's one thing which corporates should really yes. encourage. Yes. That's one thing I yes. corporate because there's so many mothers who would have loved to. But just the separation. You of need the a area. little bit of a space. I mean, if most sometimes we're really constrained with space, but mm. if you really want to, you can find it. Even a container somewhere that mm. you you kit out to a space where a safe space where children can be, be, and their mothers can interact with them. I think would be useful. But ten months is when they are adored, no, isn't it? Oh. <laughs> She's absolutely adorable. <laughs> So, I mean, you're leaving Ghana, you're going to Eritrea. What, what are some of the responsibilities that you would have in Eritrea? It should be different, or is it the same? It's actually different. So I'm leaving UNICEF also as I'm leaving Ghana. Ah, yes, yes, to, yes, to yes. the UN? Yes, UNICEF oh. is loaning me to the resident coordinator system. Okay. So the resident coordinator is the one who is supposed to make sure that all the different um, UN agencies in the country are coordinated mm -hmm. and is the main spokesperson, UN spokesperson with government. Uh, is there any chance that you ever posted back to Ghana and said, well, you know, maybe after five years, don't go back home or <laughs> never, you never, you know, you don't, you don't repeat where you've been? It's, no, you can repeat if it's a different function. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. I think you can repeat. It will be hard to go back home though, because I think the system is home as in Cameroon, Cameroon. for me, because the system is set up in such a way with these 
level of functions, it had to be in your own country because of the perceived stress that you might face mm -hmm. being in your own country with your own family, your own friends, your own networks um, in the country. You, you, are you looking forward to uh, returning? It's going to be a great experience, I think. Um, Asmara has just become World Heritage um, Site. Okay. Yes, Asmara is very beautiful. Um, the highlands are very beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's going to be very different. 2,600 meters above sea level. That's high. That's very high. <laughs> they have oxygen. Very, very they have, high. Ox have you checked? They have oxygen? I, apparently, it takes you a little bit of time for your body to realize that there is oxygen, but there is. Well, people live there. Girme highly lives, you yeah. know, is from there. So, so I'm sure I and um, I will be fine, but it's, yes, yeah, going to be a change. I, I mean, I checked it out on the internet. We have this Italian influence. And it's, they do, yes. It's the Italians little... pass through Eritrea. You'll be at home because you've, you've done a bit of room. So yeah, indeed. You... I can practice my Italian. <laughs> What's, uh, what would you tell, you know, young black ladies, you know, growing up? I mean, you've been there, you've done that. Something to inspire. Some Something to inspire. Power. You know, the, the, the young black one probably in school, probably searching. I think, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, maybe nobody out there Nobody out there has the full answer mm. of anything. Because when you're young, you feel, you feel not confident. You think everybody knows and you don't know. You think all the people who are ahead of you or more senior than you that they have arrived. No, nobody fully knows the answer of anything. Mm. Yeah? So be confident in yourself. Try and be confident in your abilities. Um, be ambitious for the contributions you can make. Um, many people self-censor themselves. Would, would it be harder as a black woman? Is it harder going up the ladder? Depends. I think... <laughs> that difficult questions to ask. Um, I think in the United Nations, as in other institutions, the prevailing societal biases exist. So the UN, for instance, does not operate in isolation of the bigger society. Mm -hmm. So if we do have problems of racism and sexism in the wider society, I think we should expect that it is everywhere. I think as a UN, of course, we should make greater efforts to stamp it out. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, it exists. But I, I have been fortunate enough where, you know, I, I try not to, it's good to know that these things exist so you can you can be more resilient, mm -hmm. uh, not at the first criticism or the first um, 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 vision of something fishy happening, you don't crumble. Uh, you should never crumble. Mm -hmm. So you should know, so you should be a bit more resilient within yourself. But I personally have um, been able to just not focus on things like that. I don't mm -hmm. focus. I focus on what I think I can deliver. I focus on doing as best as I can. Mm -hmm. I focus on being very resilient. Um, some advice I give to my own colleagues is your work, of course, should play an important part in your life. Um, it's, these are important things. It's, it's a good contribution. But your work is not everything. The rest of your life needs to be as good so that when you inevitably face disappointments at work, you have something to, to, to sort of hold you and shield you. And so you have to invest in all parts of your life. So you're a relatively solid person because the disappointments at work will definitely happen. But I think as a young person, resilience, just belief in yourself, have some real um, ambitions for the contributions you can make. Don't, you shouldn't be the one to limit yourself. There's the rest of the world there that would try to do it for you. But you shouldn't be the one that says, no, I can't do that. No, I can't aspire for this. No. Aspire. Then as practically as you can, okay, think, what do I need to do to be able to do that? Constantly changing and adapting as you can. Suzanne Ngongi Namondo. Now that's an interview and a half, wasn't it? Didn't you enjoy it? I definitely did. Suzanne, thank you so much. And I say that, you know, Ghana, I'm sure we will miss you. We will. <laughs> Those who came in contact with you would definitely miss you. Larger than life character. Very beautiful. 
Until next Friday, then I come to you with a different personality that has been personality profile with Susan Ngonge, who is UNICEF representative for Ghana, not for long. And let's say happy, happy birthday in advance, 7th mm -hmm. of August will be her birthday. I wish her all the best. Susan, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good talking to you. Likewise.